record. Okay. Okay, now we're recording. And this is my very first go-to meeting, so I'm excited and a little freaked out. This is, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So no. No? No. no. Okay. This is workflow workshop, right? Yeah, um, right. Oh, yeah, this, okay. Hi there, welcome. Um, yes, this is the workflow workshop. Okay, how about that? Now there you go. Oh, yay. Okay. Whew. A little bit of stress here. That's okay. Performance anxiety. Yay. Okay. Um, so this is my Realvolve account that we use in our, my, I have a little virtual assistant business for Realvolve that helps people get um, up and running. And so this is, this is the account that we use um, and wanted to show you uh, first, you know, take 20 minutes or so and just kind of walk you through the process of what a workflow is um, and how to do a really simple one. And then I'm going to open it up to questions and try to answer the things that have possibly been stopping you. Okay, so we'll start with this is a dashboard. We all know this. And in order to in, in order to um, start writing a workflow, we, have, we, we go to the workflow portion. Okay, and here is our editor. Did anyone else's screen just go black? I mean, mine, it just went black. What about everyone else can see? We can see. You can see. Okay, I don't know what just happened here. Um, yeah, it looks like it should be. Wait, there's Ronald Gorman says, I don't see anything. Oh, now you see it now? Are you good, Ronald? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, so I'm not sure what happened to your screen. I hope it comes back. Okay, so um, this is the workflow editor, and in order to start working, writing a workflow is hitting this little cross here to start a new workflow, add new. And you can either create a new workflow, import one from CSV, I have no idea what, how that works, never tried it, or you can add workflows from the library. So in this particular case, my goal here is to teach you how to create your own workflow, so that's what we're gonna do. Um, actually, I'm going to back it up a second because I actually wanted to show you a flow chart before I got into showing you how to write a workflow. Um, so um, people love my flow charts. They take me forever to write. Otherwise, I'd create more of them. But I just kind of wanted to give you a sense of how workflows can get you from point A to point B. So this is a workflow that takes you from contact to close. Right. So the yellow is, you know, a, a decision point. So you meet a contact and you stick them into Realvolve. And you can choose from one of two workflows, right? Follow up for me. This is my basic workflows. Follow up one time a week or follow up two times a month, right? Because, you know, some people you need more frequent follow up than others. And then the goal of the follow up is to create a client right here. And if they're a client, they're one of two types of clients, right? They're either a buyer or a seller. So if they're a buyer, then we're going to proceed to show them property and move them through the process of finding and, you know, uh, securing a property. And once you get them under contract, whatever that means in your geography, then we can go to the buyer escrow workflow or in Chicago Ames. I don't know what you guys call it once your attorneys bless everything, but that process of going through your due diligence, getting your loan approved, your appraisal, your inspections, all that good stuff. That's what buyer escrow is for me. And then if everything goes well, going through to close, but if they're a seller, a little more complicated, um, you'd have to go, you'd have to get the listing appointment done. So I have a workflow just for listing appointments. And then hopefully from that, you get the listing. And once you get the listing, you've got to do your listing marketing. And so there's a workflow for that. And one of two things can happen once you do your marketing, either you get no offers um, and you need to do what I call the listing maintenance workflow flow, which for me is a little bit different than the initial listing marketing. Um, and it includes things like updating the CMA, um, making recommendations on price adjustments and tactical maneuvers to position you better into the marketplace, like adjusting your price. But at the end of all of that, your goal is to get into, um, you know, listing escrow. Um, the other thing that can happen, of course, is from listing marketing is right away you get offers and you go into listing escrow and then that moves into close. So that is like a flow chart of how different workflows can come together um, as parts to get you from point A to point B. Does that make sense? Yes. Crickets? No? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. 
<laughs> Thank you. When there's crickets, I think I've lost you all. So let's return back to the idea of creating a workflow. And I'm just going to walk you through creating a super, super simple one. Um, and in this case, it's going to be just the follow up. All right. So one time a week. This is one that I've written, you know, many, many times. But I just wanted to give you a sense of the parts and what I was thinking as I was doing it. Now, when you create a workflow, you can create it to apply to one of three things, a contact, a property, or a transaction. And if you, if you start a workflow and you apply it to, say, a property and you realize that's not what you meant to do, you really wanted to apply it to a person, you can't switch it over, okay? So they're, they're not interchangeable. They're very actually separate silos. So be careful about which one you choose. Um, I think it's obvious which one is which, but basically a workflow that applies to a contact is something you're going to do with just a person. A workflow that applies to a property is generally things around listing marketing, uh, getting a listing, managing a listing, or, or following up on a listing, right? Um, and then a transaction, I think, is the most obvious of all. That applies to when you're in escrow on something and processing it. Okay. And the reason that they're completely different is that our merge fields and the dates that we use um, are completely different from one silo to another. And that's why you can't interchange them. Okay, so if you make a mistake, then um, basically start a new workflow with the right one and copy them over one by one. All right, description, obvious. Uh, we're not going to work for the moment with more complicated things like alternate workflows or groups. That's for a more advanced day. So we're going to add this workflow, follow up one times a week, and now we get the option to add another activity to the workflow. So when you do this, this is the activity window. And here's where um, vocabulary really hitched me up. Um, there was activity and then there was action. And to me, they were two same things, right? In RealVolve, an activity is what we do. We string a bunch of activities together, and that stringing together is what a workflow is, okay? So think of that as in your linear task list. That would just be like do A, do B, do C, do D. Each one of those is an activity, an action is what you need to do in order to complete the activity. Does that make sense? So you have the activity, which is the to-do, and then you have your action. That's what to complete it. So your activity might be um, uh, send a letter to, you know, to basically uh, introduce yourself to the other parties of the transaction. That's the activity. The action is send this email to all the parties in the transaction, and the email is the one that introduces all of the party members. So activity versus action, a, a, a different distinction. So in this particular act, in this particular workflow, we want to follow up with people, and so the first thing that we want to do is call. Right? I call it the initial phone call. So you got. Uh, you got the lead from Zillow, from your website. Uh, somebody called you and say, hey, call Joe. He's thinking about you know, buying a house, whatever it is. So the initial call. And then here's the other thing is assigning it. Now, uh, some of you on the call are single agents, but many of us are team leaders and we have people in our team. So when you're writing a workflow, it's important, in my opinion, to assign it to a role rather than a person so that when you have people that change in your business, you don't have to change your workflows, right? So in this particular case, the follow-up is probably going to be assigned to a buyer's agent that gets the lead. And so that's who that that's going to be assigned it. You can assign it with um, an interested party. We're not going to use that for this workflow because, again, we're doing something real simple. And then the initial phone call is exactly when we're going to start it. So we get the lead. We put it into Realvolve. We apply the workflow. The day that you apply the workflow, that's your start date. Right. So the first thing that you want to happen when you apply this workflow is that initial phone call. So it's going to be zero days after the start date. Now, we're going to show you how powerful this scheduling um, box is. But right now, just initial phone call, we're going to stick with that. So that's where it is. Um, and this one, if anybody uses Getting Things Done by David Allen, um, you know the concept of grouping your actions together. And so that's why we have this drop-down list. In this particular case, it's a phone call. So we're going to label it as a call. 
That way, when you're looking at your all of your tasks to do, you can just hit all the phone calls and make them all at once and batch them. Okay? Um, and then there's a lot of other ways that you can prioritize the to-dos as they appear to you on the dashboard um, as you prefer. So this one is complete, just the initial phone call, so we're going to add that. Now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to call every seven days after that initial phone call, okay? So how do we do that? Now, there's a lot of ways to do repeating, um, repeating phone calls. Okay, we're going to call this call one time a week. So one of the ways that you can do a repeating phone call is to use this repeat function. And anybody who uses uh, a computerized calendar knows how to do this. If you use Google Calendar or anything like that, you've got this uh, a way that you can repeat things, right? So here it is. We've got the same kind of a thing. You can repeat it every day. You can repeat it every weekday, Monday through Friday, or every other day, every Tuesday or Thursday, or my favorite is weekly, right? And so you could say, I want to, I want to call every week on Monday and I want to do that for 20 times. Okay. So you can use this frequency function, but here's what the challenge is with um, a follow-up. You don't, you, you want to call once a week, but you want, you don't want to uh, call too frequently, right? So let's just say that you went with the, I want to call every Monday. What happens if on Monday, um, every one of your escrows has something that goes on fire and you need to put those fires out. And so you don't make your prospecting phone calls on Monday. Let's just say that those fires go for two, three days and you get to Thursday and you haven't made your Monday phone calls. And on Thursday, you're like, no, no, no I got to do it. So on Thursday, you make all of your prospecting phone calls. Well, what happens on Monday when your prospecting phone calls pop up on your schedule? You're going to say, oh, I can't call today. I just called everybody three days ago. Right? So here's another way to take a look at scheduling. I'm going to reset this to none. Instead of having a frequency thing, why not use this really powerful scheduling box and use a computed date? This computed date is going to be your friend. And we're going to talk about how you use this to write all kinds of workflows. But let's talk about this one instance, making a phone call every seven days. So I want to make this phone call every seven days after. And now what we need to do is we need to think about a trigger date. So this is very, very different than say Basecamp or Top Producer or pretty much any other program you've ever used. Our different ways of being able to compute a date, a date are amazing. So you could start it seven days before or after any of these things, a birth date, a home anniversary date, uh, the day you, that you referred them or they referred you, their wedding anniversary. Uh, just a whole bunch of different things. In this particular case, I want to call every seven days, and I want to call it from the last time I called. So we're going to make this seven days after the last call date. What does that mean? If I don't call until Thursday, I'm not going to get a reminder to call until next week on Thursday. And let's say Thursday comes and that's the day my escrows blow up and I don't make any prospecting phone calls on Thursday. I don't call until Friday. It, the next time I get a reminder is going to be seven days from that day, which will be next Friday. So a really, really powerful way to make sure that your reminders show up when you actually need them to show up. Um, one would call it intelligent as opposed to stupid. Okay, so that is calling the one time a week. So we have our initial phone call, and then we have call one time a week. So let's go ahead and add that. The next thing that I'm going to do is I want to tag the workflow because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, I just like to know how many people are in my system that are running this particular workflow, right? So we're going to assign that to a buyer's agent. I don't remember I did that on the last one. Um, and we're going to create an action. So remember, an action is what we need to complete the activity. So the activity is tag the workflow. So an action is to add or remove tags. It could also be to send a message. It could be um, a lot of things. Tag follow up one time a week. Okay, so that's, that's our tag, 
and we're going to choose a tag to add and um, I had a tag follow up. Yeah, so I have a tag follow up. So I'll go ahead and select that one. And so here's what's going to happen. When I run this action, Realvolve is going to add a tag to this contact. And I'll now know that they are somebody in my system. So if I want to just pull up everybody in my system that's being followed up with, let's just say I want to see who my agents are following up with. Or let's say I want a list of all the people I'm supposed to be following up with. I can pull them up by the tag. All right. One last thing. Um, let's go ahead and add this activity. Um, on this initial phone call, and actually on the other one too, we can make this really powerful. Do you see this thing here called checklist? The checklist is super powerful, and this is bonus points, frankly, but everybody has heard Mark say at one point or another, we can use a merge field. What is a merge field? A merge field is a, is a placeholder. It's a container in Realvolve, and that container holds some information, and that information has a label. So in this particular case, let's say that it's the contact's home, uh, home mobile phone. Okay, so I have just said to Realvolve, look, I want to have a checklist that fills in the home mobile phone for for the person I'm, I'm talking to. And then I want Realvolve to find um, I want Realvolve to uh, have a container called last call date. And I want that in there as well. And then I also want Realvolve to take a look at the container that is notes. And I want to put that in there. Okay, I'm going to show you how powerful this looks in a second when I apply this workflow. Um, but putting information into a checklist is going to make your activity when you check it off amazing. All right, so I'm going to go with that. So that is. You're going to come back to that, right, Kendall? <laughs> yes, I'm going to come back to that. Actually, I'm going to show. I'm going to show You're, you. I'm going to show it to you okay. now. All right, so okay. let's take a look at this workflow. I just wrote this workflow, follow up one times a week, and I want you to see how it actually looks. So Amy, because you're my favorite, no no, no um, insult to anybody else on the call, but you know, this is Amy. Um, so this is Amy's record here in workflow, and I'm going to apply this workflow to her. Okay, so you do that by hitting the start the workflow, and we're just going to go with the follow-up one time a week. This is the one that I, I wrote before, uh, but it's exactly what I just showed you. And the person we're applying it to is Amy Curtis. Then we hit next. In the next button is actually all of the different um, activities that are in this workflow. Um, and I want all of them. You could, if you wanted to, you could say, you know what? I don't need to decide what to do. She's, she's going to be fine. OK, you could take that one off and it wouldn't actually show up on your dashboard. But we're going to go with all of them right now. Hit next. And then the buyer's agent, it could be anybody on your team. So this is all of the people um, that are on my Realvolve team here. And I could pick any one of them and assign it to them. But for simplicity, we're just going to keep it to me. And I'm the buyer's agent. And then we're going to apply dates. Now, sometimes you're going to start a workflow and you don't want the start date to be today you actually met them uh, quite some time ago and you'd like to backdate the start date. You can do that if you like to. Most of the time, you're just going to leave this alone. All right. So we're going to hit done. And now it is applying some, it's creating the activities right there. So there's two places where you get to see those activities. You either find them here in Amy's contact uh, activities tab. And this shows me all of the activities that are applied to the Amy contact record. Um, but very few of us are going to remember to check the individual contacts, right? So here's where you're going to see all your activities. This is really important. Your dashboard is where you should be living. This is what you should fire up at 6 o'clock in the morning, every morning. Fire up your dashboard and find out what's urgent for today. So in this particular case, you can see that we have the basic follow-up one time a week, and that's been applied to Amy Curtis, and it shows up in red because it's due today. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to hit mark is complete and we're going to add the keep in touch workflow tag to Amy's contact record. So I'm going to hit run and now Amy's contact has been tagged with this. 
The second thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and click this initial follow-up. Now this is what I meant by the checklist being so powerful. See how it says checklist? I just hit this, this check mark here, got the checklist. If Amy's home number had been in the contract record, it would show it would have showed up right there already pre-filled. Um, so let's just say that Amy's phone number is one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay. That would have shown up right there. Um, and I could have picked up the phone and I could have dialed that number. And while I'm talking to Amy, Amy says, oh yeah, uh, need to get my down payment together. Should be done in, um, uh, seven days. Okay. So now I've written some notes right there while I was talking to her, right after I talked to her. And I want to make sure I know when the last call date was that's today. So I'm going to hit today. And now that's been filled in, hit save and close. Okay. Now here's what's going to happen on Amy's contact record. Um, first of all, we can see that her keep in touch one by six workflow tag has been applied. Then the notes need to get my down payment done in seven days. That has been done right here. And then because we filled in the last call date with her activities, we now know that the call one time a week is now going to be scheduled for May 10th. Whereas before it didn't have a date. So we called on May 3rd, seven days from May 3rd is May 10th. And now on May 10th, this call one time a week is going to show up on my dashboard. And by the way, when I click that one off, here we go. There's the phone number. The last time I called is right there. Okay. Um, and let's just, just go ahead and say, now I've called on the 10th. Now I'm going to fill out last call date is 10th. And now we're going to make some notes right there. Save and close. And on her radar will be the notes that I just made in the checklist. So that kind of gives you an idea of the power of a workflow. I just wanted to show you um, what that flow chart looks like. So the initial phone call is here, and here are the components of the activity. We're assigning it to the buyer's agent. It's zero days from the start date, and there is a checklist of the number, the notes, and the last call date. Um, from the initial call, we need to tag it. That's what the, that's what the um, activity looks like, call, tagging it one time a week follow-up. From the tag, we're going to start calling one time a week, and it has a checklist. It's assigned to the buyer's agent. It's time for seven days from the last call date. There's a checklist. Again, the, the, the phone number, the notes, um, and the last call date. And then at some point, we're going to need to make a decision. Um, and in this particular case, I timed the decision for 18 weeks from the day we start. So in 18 weeks, I'm going to be asked to make a decision. Do you want to continue? If it's yes, then we just continue. It renews and continues. If it's a no, then we're going to deactivate and remove the tag. Does that make sense? So can I just ask, so the checklist. Yes. Is that makes it easier that when you're sitting on your dashboard and you see that you have to follow up with me, mm -hmm. that checklist that my phone number's right there and that you can just add notes mm -hmm. from the dashboard. Are you saying that's the benefit of, of creating those, that checklist? Yeah, because it's or, and, okay. that if you've got like 10 phone calls to make, you're just going to sit there, check, Make phone calls, make notes, enter the last call date, save and close, next. From your dashboard. Yes. So it's like you're not having to go find me, what's her phone number, jotting it down on a post-it note, okay, Correct. I called her, now i got to go follow up. Correct. Yeah. That's so. really pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah. So can I, can I ask you one other question? When you were doing that checklist in the merge field, so one of them was mobile phone, and, and I mean, was notes one of them? I'm sorry? Could you could you go back to where you created a checklist for where, that stuff in the workflow? Where I created the checklist? Sure. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go with the initial follow-up phone call. Okay. So there's the checklist. Okay.
So if you were to think about a checklist, a checklist would be is what do you need, what's going to make it easy to reach this person and do what you got to do right from the dashboard? Yeah, in, in this now, the, the challenge with all of this um, is knowing what you can put into the checklist, right? So a lot of times your checklist is going to be things that have nothing to do with Realvolve. Like if it's a document checklist, you know, you, you've got an activity, you need to collect all the documents um, so that your folder is complete, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's just a free form. You're, you're just going through and pulling up all of the documents that you can think of and it has nothing to do with Realvolve. It has everything to do with what works for you. Right. No, I got that. I mean, I've used other checklists, but like this is, that's really awesome because what you do is if you make that mm -hmm. checklist a step in your workflow and you do that, then you can just work off your dashboard. Yes. Yes. And so the, the idea is, does everybody know about the uh, merge field manual? No. Okay. So the, where the heck is it? Hang on a second. Uh, this is kind of like the Bible that I use. Sorry, I should have a bookmark if it's my Bible, right? So you have a workflow tutorial, which is a, a PDF of everything that it takes to write a workflow. Um, don't worry if this thing makes your eyes cross, made my eyes cross. Uh, but what's important is the addenda in the back, the appendix, and that is the merge fields. So I actually created a separate um, PDF for myself, and I have this open whenever I'm trying to write a workflow. And these are all the merge fields you can use, and this is what gives you so much power. Um, sometimes just looking at the merge fields will give you an idea. It's like, oh, I didn't know that Realvolve can use the Twitter handle. That's a, that's a merge field. You know, I'd really like to be able to send a letter that autofills the Twitter handle. Or I'd really like to be able to tweet them and I'd want to see on my dashboard what their tw Twitter handle is. So, you know, it's right there. Obviously, I have to look it up. Right. So that's th this is like a super, super powerful document when you're when you're writing any kind of workflow. All right. Um, let's see. I did that. I did that. The last thing I wanted to show you is the. Um, the spreadsheet that we use, the worksheet that we use to write workflows. So this is a simple table and it's in that workflow manual. Um, and it ha and it's just, I, I do it in Evernote. You could do it on, on Excel. It really doesn't matter. It's just a table, right? Um, and this particular one was when I was starting to write my listing maintenance workflow. And this is how I started with writing workflows. Now I, I don't need this uh, tool anymore because I understand how Realvolve works. But until you understand it, the challenge with workflows is that they're fundamentally different than a two-dimensional to-do list. But this table allows you to start transitioning from that two-dimensional list into something that's three-dimensional. Okay, So the two dimensions are to take everything that you have in a, you probably have it on a piece of paper somewhere. You've got this You've got this checklist of things that you need to do to open escrow. You've got a checklist of things that you need to do uh, once you take a listing, right? And your checklist has things like, uh, you know, order the pictures, uh, you know, order the preliminary title report, um, you know, write the ad copy, uh, fill out the initial sales sheet for, you know, the office, right? I mean, that that's your, you probably have a checklist like that running around somewhere. And if you don't, you need one. Okay. So what you do first is you take that, that checklist and you start filling things into the title, just, just straight up, you know, boom, 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 exactly the way you have it right now. I got a, this is listing maintenance. So this is what happens after we've um, finished our initial marketing. And now what we need to do is we need to record showings. We need to um, deal with our social media. We need to update the comparables. Uh, we need to call to review um, with the seller what's going on. We need to schedule open houses. We need to um, uh, keep track of our hits on the various portals. Uh, we need to upload any showing time uh, feedback that we get. We need to create our seller's report and send them. Uh, we need to call the agents of any active competing listings to find out what's going on on their end of the world. Uh, we need to schedule, um, I got open house twice here, op update open home pro. So these are the things that we had in our uh, two-dimensional checklist. 
Okay, so you do all that. And the next thing you need to think about is, well, who should do these, right? Because if you've got a piece of paper, then it's just one piece of paper. And if you've got more than one person in your business, maybe what you have is that each person in your business has a copy of the same piece of paper, right? But um, they're doing different things on that one. So how about thinking to yourself, all right, showings is done by the assistant, updating the comp uh, comparables. Maybe that's something that listing agent should do. Called review, you know, that's probably something that the listing agent should do. Um, you know, open house, scheduling the open house, maybe that's the marketing gal. Now, some of you, um, you don't have staff yet, but you will, right? You will, because if you're a single agent and you've taken the time out to be in this phone call, and if you're interested in leveraging Realvolve, you're not going to stay a single agent for very long because you are part of the very few that are truly invested in being a professional and being excellent. So at some point, probably in the very near future, you're going to bring on your first assistant or your first buyer's agent, um, and your business is going to grow. So think about it like that today, right? So who's going to do, you know, the marketing? Who's going to do that? Who's going to pull the stats for this, okay? Um, who's going to upload the showing time um, stuff, okay? Um, I should probably not be so sexist. It could be a marketing guy, but you know, happens to be my marketing person is a female. So there you go. So go through and you assign it. And then here's where um, workflows get really powerful. And that is to figure out when you want to do to show up on your dashboard. Okay. And so right now you're probably thinking, well, how do I know when I'm going to schedule the open house. I mean, you know, we did that first one, but open houses aren't that common in my neighborhood. And I don't know when I'm going to need to do an open house or I'm going to, you know, whatever. The thing that I want you to think about is I want you to um, really sit for a second and think, is there a trigger thing that happened? Some, some kind of trigger that when this happens, the next thing happens. So the example that I like to use is for listing marketing. Um, I can't do a whole bunch of things until I get the pictures, but I don't know when the pictures are going to get taken because I can't take pictures until it's clean and ready. And if I'm staging, all staged. So, you know, when am I going to do the pictures? When I'm going to have them and right? So how could I possibly write a, a to do? I don't know how many days it's going to take to get the pictures, but I do know that from the day that the pictures are taken, it's going to be three days for me to get them back, right? At least that's what it is for me. So the trigger for sending uh, the brochures to be printed or finishing the single property website, the trigger for me is getting those pictures. So we can actually schedule it from photography date. That's the trigger date for me. Photography date, three days later, we can send the brochure for print. So if the, if, the act, if the title is send brochure for print, the who is the marketing gal, it's going to be three days, that's days, weeks, months, years. So three days um, after, that's B is for before, A is for after, three days after, and the trigger is photography date. How do you know what your trigger dates are? You have to take a look at the merge fields thing again, right? So here's all our merge fields. Let's go to um, property. Um, and here's all the date fields that you can use for a property, right? So you can create a trigger date, uh, an activity that is triggered off of, say, uh, the inspection contingency due for chimneys. Send a note saying remove this contingency three days after chimney inspection contingency date. Does that make sense? Yes, it talks to me, yeah. Okay. Is this any different than what you understood so far? Is that a yes? Is this one that we're using, is this just a checklist so that when you get ready to create your workflow, you have something to stick in there? That's correct. Okay. okay. That's exactly it. This is this is what helps you because if you're just to look at the activity window and try to create this, most of us are really visual. Um, and that activity window, this window right here, is pretty big. 
right? And so you'll write your activity and then it's easy to get lost to not know what you need to do next. And so this table is what keeps you on track for writing your workflow. So many people yeah. write their entire workflow on this table. And then once they finish that, then they, then they start transferring it to Realvolve. Okay, that may, that right there, Kendall, just did it for me. Now I get it. <laughs> really? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm, like, so excited. So here's the other thing that I did, and let's see if I can find it. Um, it's, it wasn't unusual for me to look at that and say, okay, so that was wonderful, but, you know, now, like, for example, send, sell a report, right? Um, I'm like, okay, well, I want to write the letter. Um, that goes with that. And I only want to write it once. So, you know, what I would do is I'd look at that and I'd say, all right, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write that letter. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can find a letter in here because I had a whole bunch of them. Um, let's just say this is it. One inch from the wall. This is a blog post that I did. So, I don't know if any of you use Evernote, but you know most of you can do this. I wrote the letter in in Realvolve, the whole thing, just the way I wanted to to do, um, and then I took that link and I stuck it right here. Send the seller report, um, and I just added it as a link, right? So I put that right there, and so this is the way because I did the whole thing in Evernote um, when I first started out. So it's like, okay, that's what it is. This is what I'm doing is I'm writing things over. I said, oh, I'm going to send the seller report. Great. So I'll do the whole little activity right there, right? Um, let's not mess with this one. Now, yeah, let's go ahead and mess with it. I know how to do it. So let's just say uh, we're going to add an activity. And uh, just for the sake of fun, let's say add an activity, send the report, right? And so I want to attach a letter to it, right? So I'm like, all right send report and I want to attach the letter and now I want to do it as an email um, and I, I actually need to attach the letter, right? But you got to write the letter first before you can attach it. I'm not doing this in a very good order. Sorry, guys. So when I'm writing these things, I usually have two tabs open, one for the workflow that you see right now and then one for the templates. So I would start a new template, author a new template. I would name it. Um, whatever it is I wanted it to be, test template. You know, we're doing this one as a contact. And then what I would do is I'd go back to Evernote and I'd say, okay, send seller report. That's the one that I wrote. Let's copy it. And let's go over to the template and let's paste that puppy. Um, we're not going to mess with merge fields real quick for now. Now I would hit save. Subject cannot be empty. All right. Test template. There we go. So we've saved it. Now we're going to go back over to that workflow, um, and we're going to create that action. Send letter. We're going to do this again. Send manually with preview. You can do this a, a lot of different ways. There are other people who don't need to check things before they send it. I always do because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, and there's the test template letter. I've attached it, and now I'm going to hit save. So. That's how you kind of transfer over from the workflow that you wrote in, for example, Evernote. But this would work on uh, a CSV file, Excel, Google, Do uh, Google Sheets. You can do it a lot of different ways. Um, you can write your letters and attach it to the different things all within Evernote. And then when you're done, transfer it over to Realvolve. Can I ask a question here? Of course. Okay. So... I mean, I have a couple of workflows written, and so I never really had, I mean, my checklists were always in my head, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, like, I'd have a deal, and i kind of just have my mental checklist or the photos, blah, blah, blah. And then I understand, like, other people, like, they would say they use their Google Calendar or, yeah. you know, whatever. So a workflow, if I'm understanding correctly, is instead of taking my checklist that I know when I have a new listing, here is my checklist of things that I do and plotting that on my calendar, you're more or less saying, like, this is a calendar of activities that will match a li any listing I have. Yep. And it'll, like, 
always be there. Like it's really, it's, it's really, I don't want to say it's no different than your checklist, but it's just a checklist that you don't have to recreate, recreate again and again and again. Yeah, it's a template. It's a template that you apply over and over and over again. Um, and with each deal, you can make, you know, the little changes you need to so that this template applies to that unique listing. Okay. And also makes it a lot, it also makes it a lot easier, um, to, um, assign tasks to other people within your business. Right. Right. And then, and then it also makes it easy to see if that person actually did the task. Okay. Right. I got you. All right. So Jean said, can I ask a question that might be complicated or advanced? Uh, duh, that's what we're here for. Go for it, girlfriend. Are you still there? Jean, I'm here. Talking. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. So what's your, what's your question? You got really close because you were putting the activity that sends an email or send a message. But my next thing was, how do you get the merge field into that? Oh, okay. So let me show you um, merge field. So again, um, I refer you to the lovely handy dandy merge field guide. That's like super important. Um, let's see what we've got here. So here's just a very simple one. Um, so in this particular letter, which is sent to the buyer after we close, the merge field that we've used is uh, the buyer's greeting. So, you know, we're saying we don't want to greet the seller. We don't want to greet the property manager. We want to greet the buyer. So we can use the merge field buyer greeting. Um, and what that does is it, it, it uh, puts in, let's just say it's a husband and wife. When you use the merge field uh, greeting, a real vault will automatically insert how these people want to be greeted. Will it be Dr. Smith and, and Janine? Or will it be, Ron and Jamine, Janine, or will it be just Ron? I mean, real Volvo will know, and you don't have to think about it each time. So that's why a merge field is really powerful. Um, and then also, congratulations on the close of this particular street address. Just a merge field um, that doesn't look like it's powerful, but it really is, because when you use a merge field like transaction street address within a templated letter, it doesn't look like a templated letter anymore, right? Um, and the more merge fields you use, the less it feels like it was, you know, not meant for them. D does that answer your question, Jean? Yes, that was super handy. Thank you so much. Yeah, here's one that's more complicated. This is um, my opening letter to the listing agent. And as you can see, I've got a whole bitch load of, of, of merge fields here. Um, and again, when this letter gets sent out, it just becomes very unique and very useful. So let me just show you how you do a merge field. Let's do a new template real quick. Um, so what you do, you start writing it. It's like, oh, I want that greeting. So you actually start. Oh, got to do it in a contact. All right. Okay. Now it knows what it's being used for. Um, and that's this use for here. This is how it determines what merge fields it can put in. If you don't put it in there, you use the wrong one, you'll get wrong merge fields. So as you can see, it starts trying to autofill the minute I, the minute I put anything in. So dear greeting, uh, love your, um, let's see, this is I'm trying to think what kind of what merge fields do I have? And greeting you're saying is going to pick up a person. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how does it know? Well, that's the so on um, a person, let's go back to you, Amy. In the contact right here, the contact tab, um, mm -hmm. this is the personal details. So if we open this uh, relationship status, this is where we can um, modify the greeting, right? So let's say you're married. Amy, what's your husband's name? Or pick a name. Dave. I'm sorry? Dave. All right, so Dave um, Curtis? Yep. Okay, so I've just typed Dave Curtis. I, he's not in Realvolve for me, so I typed in his name. I hit enter. Realvolve has actually now made a record for Dave Curtis. So Amy is married to Dave, um, and the greeting is now Amy and Dave, right? But maybe 
that wouldn't go so well. Maybe Dave needs to be first. So I can um, Dave and Amy. So now I've modified the greeting to Dave and Amy. Whenever I use the merge field for either Dave or Amy, either one, the greeting is always going to show up, hey, Dave and Amy. Okay. Right? So that's how we do it. So it's always going to default the way you have it. But if you have somebody that, you know, you know, needs something special, this is where you would modify it. And then I can also merge over to Dave's contact, uh, the kids, the tags, the home phone number and the home address. Right. Mm -hmm. So now when I find Dave Curtis in real evolve, he's now there. He wasn't there before. He's married to Amy Curtis, and he has the same tags that you had. And if if I had a home address and whatnot for you, it would also say, show up on his record. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool, cool and cool. So we were talking about, oh, like we're real. talking about template editors. So, you know, we're writing a template. We're writing it to a contact. We know about the greeting thing, but we're not sure what other ones we can use. So this is how you would look. This is how you'd use it. Here's the appendix of merge fields, and these are the merge fields that we can use with a contact. Um, so, um, like, for example, showing report is there, right? So we could actually say this is your, and then merge field showing report. And that's actually what would get filled in. Anything that's under the showing report will actually get filled in right there. So you would take a look at this merge field and say, oh, I'd like to use the activity date. Um, I'd like to be able to put in my service area. Whatever it is that you'd like to do, it's right there. See, that's, where just, that's just where it got confusing, where you just said that, where like you could say, like, this is your showing report. Yeah. And you put that. Then it's like, well, what, what would go in there? I can't. Yeah. I, can't I mean, my, that's where my brain gets yeah. scrambled. I realize that probably wasn't a very good example to use um because that means that on the contacts go back to amy um you would have um you would have added showings in here so if you were working with amy at, if i was working with you amy as a buyer and i was mm -hmm. using the showings to have to keep track of the various things i was showing you right um, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we save that, then that's actually what would go into, oh, seller. Uh, um, that's actually what would go to, would, would fall into that particular merge field. So if you don't know what a merge field is, you know, don't use it. A lot of these merge fields are ones that I'm still learning about. Let's see what else is available. Um, how about birth date? Um, your contact is? You know, your birthday is such and such, like they don't already know. As an example. So you can use these merge fields um, in any way that you want to. But this guide, this merge field guide is what's going to tell you what you can do and what you can't. So if you're looking to insert a field and it's not on the merge list, it's not something that you can use a merge field to. You're just going to have to write it in, you know, in, into the template. All right. That is kind of the prepared part, and that took way more time than I expected. Um, are there specific blocks that someone wants to throw out there for the group? Hi, Kendall. This is Sandra from Atlanta. Can I ask a quick question? Mm-hmm. Um, it's more big picture if you'll go back to your Evernote where you kind of have stuff laid out. Like that? Um, yeah. So I was just curious. Um, I, I have your, your digs workflows, and obviously we're, we're 
laid out a little different than you guys. So I was in the process of modifying them. And I was just curious, do you think more vertical or horizontal? Do you lay out like the different steps and then you go back and figure out who's doing it or do you build each one, you know, be found is it faster to build it out completely or do all the steps first? When I started word writing workflows, I had to use this table. There wasn't any other way for me to grasp the system. So, yeah, when I started out, everything was very vertical and linear. Okay. Um, at now, when I write workflows, I now am able to think in three dimensions, and I don't use this table anymore. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that, that came after a fair amount of experience. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, can I ask a question? Of so, okay, I have like, I mean, I have just a couple of simple workflows. Mm -hmm. And I do not feel like I have um, like the volume that prevents me from being able to, like if, if in my workflow it says, you know, like my to-do is to send an email about such and such. You right. know what I mean? Like just having that reminder of that to-do is enough. Like then I'll just create it. So templates, I struggle with templates. One, because I'm like, do I really say the same things all the time to people? And then the second part of it is like being drippy. Oh, yeah. I like totally I, get you there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where I struggle. Like, I feel like I'm not using, like, even in my simple workflows, I probably could have some templates in there that I'm resisting because it just, like, feels too automatic or something. I don't know. I can't. I just can't get right with the templates. Well, Ames, there's there's two there's two categories of templates in my mind. Uh, one category of templates is you know extremely functional. Um, and that is, you know, those are things that I use within the transaction and those are, you know, information carrying templates. So information that goes to the vendor of choice, you know, like there, there's a templated letter that goes to the photographer and says, you, you know, you're, you're, well, so I want to confirm your, your appointment at this address, this date, this time this person is going to be there. Here's her contact information in case you get delayed. Right. I mean, that, that's a perfect mm -hmm. example of a template and all of the information that I just said is auto filled by real volume. Right. So right. if you wrote a letter like that, you know, obviously you're not going to feel drippy and it saves you time and it, you know, it saves you from making that very quick phone call to the photographer to just confirm their time. Right. Right. But our day is lost in five minute chunks. So even if that phone call only takes you five minutes, it's it's longer than the five seconds it takes to send that templated email. Right. So that's okay. and what you're, right. Okay. right. And so for, so for you, that's probably the place to start with templated emails. I don't think that you and the way and the style of business that you run, Amy, I just don't think that you're going to be comfortable using templated emails to contact your buyers or follow up with a listing lead or, you know, any of that high touch communication. Cause that's just not your style. Right. So, I mean, I guess I'm saying like, is that okay? Like, am I still using revolve to its fullest? If I just, if, if I simply have like my workflow is just, you know, reach out to so-and-so yeah. and I don't have a template for it. Right. So, so let me tell you the story. Ames. Um, the, the follow-up workflow that I just demonstrated for you, that one came after five or six different follow-up workflows that were really elaborate. And they had pre beautifully pre-written emails. There was uh, valuable collateral that was attached to the emails, websites that I linked to that I thought were really important, uh, you know, market update. It was so elaborate. And I had to... Mm -hmm. I had everything. And you know what? They sucked. They really sucked. What really worked was a reminder to reach out every seven days. And my effective, I gotcha. because that's who I am. I'm high touch as well. It was like a reminder to right. call, touch out. I don't always call. Sometimes on that seventh day, I send a text. Sometimes on that right. day, I send an email. 
and sometimes I call, but I'm reminded to get in touch every seven days. For me, that works. And so all that elaborate stuff, while well, like it was really cool and it would do it automatically, you yeah. feel like that it didn't have to be all that. Well, it wasn't me. I mean, it might be somebody else. Um, and I still have them kicking around somewhere. I don't think I deleted them. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, they just they just did not resonate with me. I did it because I could. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not always a great thing to do it just because you can. Okay. Yeah. Are you using Boomtown or anything else like that along with this? I'm not. Okay. What is the specific question? Well, we're using Boomtown as our main CRM now right. because it's become our funnel for leads. Mm-hmm. And if we do this, I'm probably going to be the only one working this on the back end. Mm-hmm. I just don't want so many people using this, uh, multiple platforms right but i can still use it as team leader and just yep who, who am i yeah. speaking with it's erica oh hi erica sorry didn't recognize your voice yeah so um so the boomtown crm is super super awesome for lead generation and lead follow-up it is absolutely geared to take you from point of contact to the point of contract but it really can't do anything past that so far as i can tell so once it once it transitions into an actual transaction, that's when you're going to migrate it over to Realvolve, and it takes over from there. And it also is probably going to keep you nurtured until it's time for repeat business. Okay. Two ends of the funnel. Any other questions? Um, I had one. This is Brandy. Hi, Brandy. Hey, when we set up the let's say your your example of the weekly follow up yep um is there a trigger in there or a way that says what if on week 3 we've started a transaction will it automatically stop that campaign yeah we can actually do that um let's see if i can do that on the fly uh let's say let's take our follow up one time a week Um, and go in there and let's add an activity. Um, Actually, let's see. Yeah. So here's your ultimate workflow. Okay. And let's just call this uh, buyer escrow. Uh, um, Yeah. Buyer. Why is this not working? Here's a workflow. No results matching. Why is this not working? I'll choose a workflow. I uh, don't know what's going on here. I should be able to, to uh, choose a workflow that I want here in the alternate workflow. And so when, so if it, at any point, like during the, the follow-up phone calls, if you cancel it, if you just say, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, and I want to stop the workflow, delete, delete the rest of these things on there. You will automatically ask, do you want to launch this alternate workflow? So in this case it would be the buyer escrow. Yeah. And so now you're off to the races with that. Oh, I got it. So that's what the alternate workflow is for. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And, and the thing about workflows is there's so many amazing tools like that. Um, it's, it's a cursing and a bless and a blessing. The blessing is that we can do so many amazing things. The curse is that because it's not abundantly obvious right from the surface, what you can do, it makes people like us feel less than smart. And it's, it's not the case. It's just an amazing, powerful system. Right. Can I ask a quick question too? Yes. Um, under a template, say go back to the template tab. Yep. If you're creating a letter, does it know that just because you put contact as the, the um, use with? So if your workflow is is applied to a contact. It will only allow you to choose letters that are used with a contact. 
right? Well, I guess I'm going to ask, like, if to create a letter to use with a contact, you go to templates, and then. So let's create a new template. Do you mean use the use with? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm asking, like, what tells template editor that you're trying to create a letter as opposed to an action, say? Okay, so templates are always communications, not actions. So oh, you, okay. Right? Like, no. so the, only, the only choice here is, are you applying it to a contact property or transaction? And is it an email, a Facebook? Well, we no longer have Facebook and LinkedIn because they won't play with this anymore or anybody. Um, is it an email or is it a text? Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, that templated text as well. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Oh, excellent. All right, we are a little bit past our time. Is there anybody that has an urgent question that they really need to get answered? Nope. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for being the first ones to play ball with me. Um, and I hope this has been helpful and I hope this takes you over the bridge to writing workflows. But even if it doesn't, I'm going to be doing these twice a month until everybody gets it. Okay. Thank Excellent. you, Kendall. Thank you guys. Thank you. Talk to you later. Go for it. Thank you, Kendall.